This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Everybody ready? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, well, shoot. All right. <clears throat> what I want to do today or this evening is tell you about what I think is probably a absolutely overwhelming story. And it's the story of the British Empire from its earliest times until it declined and fell. Uh, I have a book called The End of Empire, and I, I didn't even know I had it. And as I started to read it, I realized, my gosh, what, an, what a fascinating story. The picture that you see is what the British Empire looked like in the 20s. There's one country that's not on there, and that's Egypt. And by then, they were part of the empire also. Other than that, it was the land that the sun never set on, the British Union Jack. What I want to do tonight is tell you the story of the empire. And it's superficial because it's way more story than we could spend the time you all would be willing to, much less if I know. It made a lot of Englishmen rich, and more of them that were rich were the people out in the empire as opposed to stockholders and whatnot. They made money, but the people who were really rich were the colonials out in the empire. They helped the development of some cultures, and they exploited almost everybody. They were not, they were not uh, altruistic about their empire. I use the East India Company as an illustration. They had more than one of these kinds of companies, but the East India Company was the biggest and the most influential. Then what I use is the decline using six illustrations. And you see them up there from India all the way through Rhodesia. And I'll talk about Egypt if time permits, which is got its own unique story. Also includes some of the famous leaders who were archetypes of the process, many of whom are missing. The most obvious one that I'm missing is I don't have anything on Gandhi because I assume that most of us have seen the movie Gandhi and know a bit about him. And then finally, what I want to do is look for parallels to the American experiment because there are more parallels here than you might think about. An empire is a group of nations ruled over by one sovereign or government. And I just give some examples of various empires throughout history. The colonial empire is a little bit different. It's a collection of territories settled by the origins population and governed by that population. So these were semi-independent subsidiaries of Great Britain. Modern colonial empires began with Portugal and Spain, and their focus to begin with and throughout most of the British Empire also was trade. Now, this I didn't know. Imperialism <clears throat> originated in the competition between the European Christians and the Ottoman Muslims. The European nations divided up the world twice, once in the 15th century, and then again in the 19th century, they felt like they had the, the power and the right to decide who in the rest of the world would be colonized by them. The British Empire was the largest empire in recorded history. At its peak, it controlled one fourth of the world in 1920. It was 50% larger than the next largest in history. It also comprised almost one fourth of the total world population, 400 million people. And that was without the United States, which was long gone by 1920. It was not assembled with a master plan. In other words, there was not a group of people back in London or back in England 
saying we want to make this spread of of colonies happen it was compiled with one formula capitalism it came apart differently in different countries but self-determination ended the day of empires and the british empire also came apart financially and we'll talk right at the end about the money part of it with its demise went their role of maintaining order in the world and then i put parentheses white man's order which is a little bit different than yellow man's order or black man's order or uh any other form of order it was white almost anglo-saxon order let's start with the symbol of the british empire winston spencer churchill he was born in 1874 when the empire was growing and died in 1965. prime minister twice led the country in the second world war he was again prime minister in 1951. He was a member of parliament for 64 years. He had five different constituencies that he was the MP for. Ideologically, he was a liberal imperialist, which is almost an oxymoron. For most of his career, he was part of the conservative party. He was its leader from 1940 to 1955. Hey, George, can I ask, sorry, yes. prime minister that long, is that unusual? Which I, one? To be a prime minister in England for that long. I thought that's pretty much they're born into that thing. He was prime minister from 1940 to 1945, and then again from 51 to 55. So a total of nine years. And I'm gonna talk about a person who was very similar to him in terms of his longevity as prime minister later on i, I meant member of parliament that long oh he, i don't know he's, he's being 50 I, I, years. I don't know that's probably a <laughs> there aren't going to be a whole lot of people how long was strom thurman in the senate long time 50 years wasn't it bill ought to know anyway Winston joined the army in 1895, so he was 21 just out of Sandhurst. He saw action in the British India. He also saw action in the Anglo-Sudan War as in North Africa. And then he was in the Second Boer War. And in the Second Boer War, he was a war correspondent. He also wrote a number of books about his campaigns and about the history of the English speaking people. In, night, in World War I, he was first Lord of the Admiralty, and he was young to be doing that. He wasn't even 40 years old. And he was held responsible for the disaster at Gallipoli. And actually, after that fiasco, he left the Admiralty and joined back into the Army and served on the West Front. In 1940, he became Prime Minister and led Great Britain throughout the war. This is interesting, and I had never read this before. As a member of the big three, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, his priorities were one, defeat of the German, but two, preservation of the empire. So as the decision-making went on throughout the war, he had an eye on keeping the empire together. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like in different places. But he, Roosevelt, wanted the Second World War to be the end of colonial empires, and Churchill did not agree with Roosevelt on that particular subject. Hey, George, this is Fred. Yes. Uh, the preservation of the empire, his, his emphasis on that is the reason we went into Africa and then came up to Italy. He and Absolutely. That's Absolutely. He did not want to spend, he wanted to protect the empire. He knew that eventually Stalin was going to beat the Germans and he would just as soon have stayed out of the heat of it. In his second term, now we're 1950 through 55, <clears throat> decolonization was going on around the world and he still supported preservation of the empire. 
he's the reason the French were let back into Indochina. And when I talk about Malaya, you'll get a better understanding of what his agenda was about the French. First, I wanna talk about the Industrial Revolution because you can't talk about them independently of each other. The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain. Many of the innovations in the Industrial Revolution were British. The British were the ones who invented the steam engine. The British are the ones who invented the railroad train. They, they were uh, the, the very much at the forefront of the industrializing of the world. By the middle of the 18th century, now this is, the, this is before America left, they were the world's leading commercial nation. They had the colonies in North America and the Caribbean, and they had military and political strength on the Indian subcontinent. <clears throat> A key participant in this revolution was this East India Company. And I'm gonna talk about the East India Company a lot. But trade and business competition were the major drivers of the Industrial Revolution. Although the boundaries of the revolution were broad, they concentrated in textile and the iron and steel industries. And if you go to England, go to Ironbridge, that's a little town down in central England, that's the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. And there is a bridge there made out of iron, the first iron bridge made in the world. It marks a turning point in history, and Great Britain was both an initiator and a beneficiary of the Industrial Revolution. It's fair to categorize the British Empire as both its parent and its benefactor. The two were linked inextricably. Now let's talk first of the first British Empire. They began their overseas colonies in the Americas in the 16th century. They were coming to the what was North America in the 16th century. By the 18th century, that's when they really expanded their, their uh, operation. In 1583, they claimed the island of Newfoundland. They did not settle it at that time. Walter Raleigh founded the Roanoke colony in North America. In 1584, it failed. Now, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, which was 1588, England started to shift their attention. Up until then, what they had been were pirates. They were preying on other nations' colonial infrastructures, and they decided to establish their own colonies. It grew in the 17th century in North America and mostly in the Caribbean. So it was growing around in here and to some degree the Hudson Bay Company in Canada and a fair amount of other things. <clears throat> and they formed what's called joint stock companies, notably the East India Company and the Virginia Company. And the Virginia Company is who settled the colony of Virginia. And they were formed to administer the colonies and trade. During the 17th century, now we're in the 1600s, they were building sugar plantations in this area and they depended on slave labor. And until they abolished the slave trade, they were responsible for three and a half million African slaves coming to the Americas, a third of all the slaves that were brought across the Atlantic. So anytime they are, they are being critical of slavery, they are a prime instigator of the problem in the, in the Americas. Now, the East India Company, it was chartered by Queen Elizabeth in 1600. It was a joint stock company. What that meant is just like any corporation we have today, you put your money in, you bought a share or two shares or however many shares of this operation and you paid for its operation and then you got some level of remuneration each year from your stock. It was originally formed to trade in the Indian Ocean. 
initially with the Mughals of India and the East Indies, and then later with China. It seized it, the company now, this is not the British Empire, the British uh, government. The company seized control of large parts of the Indian subcontinent, parts of Southeast Asia. They colonized, they, the East India Company, colonized Hong Kong. They initiated the opium trade with China, and they did that to counterbalance the cost of tea that they were getting from China. They started the opium war with China, and they acquired Hong Kong, a 98-year lease, as part of a deal with China to, uh, they, they, they threatened, they being the East India Company, threatened China with all sorts of, of mayhem if they didn't give in, and they, one of the things they gave them was Hong Kong. That's why Britain was in Hong Kong for a hundred years. They were originally chartered for trading by the 18th century. This one company accounted for half of the world's trade. Revenues by 1850 were five billion dollars in today's currency. This was one large complex operation. They assembled a private army of 260,000 men. They also had their own Navy. And if you want to see a fascinating museum in Greenwich, the National Maritime Museum has a great display of the East India Company. And when you look at it, you just cannot believe what they did. They had warships, 100 gun warships. I mean, ships of the line in a private company. It often resorted to the use of force, but its real capability was how good it was administratively. They could establish and maintain order in a tribal environment. So they'd go into these various little provinces. They would tell the man who was in charge, here's what we're gonna do for you and here's what we want from you. And the next thing you know, they were running that, that province or whatever it was better than it had been run before they were very very good at it the east india company was absolved dissolved in 1874 and at that time it became a specific part of the british empire actually res the governmental responsibilities rested with parliament they absorbed the east india company's navy and army I like this. One estimate is that the empire drained $45 trillion from India and Asia. And much of it <clears throat> wasn't actually done with the, the specific information. Didn't the, the, the wealth didn't all get back to the people who were the part, part of the uh, formation of it in the, in the, uh, uh, home organization, it was the people out in the countries that got rich, especially in India. George, was, was that off of raw materials? They were taking all that in raw materials out of those countries? Well, I thought you might find this interesting. I made this up. Here you have Great Britain and you have a colony. Well, the first thing that Great Britain does is they get taxes from the colony and they get taxes for the administrative services and particularly for safety protection. They take the money from the taxes and they pay for raw materials from the country's agricultural production, all right? So they're using their own money to pay for it. Over here you have this industrial revolution in manufacturing capacity, which then sends back consumer goods to the colony who is a market for their goods, and they would have, and, and they did this in America too, they had a constraint over who could ship in and out of their colonies. Manufacturing capacity though also had other imports and exports, but their, their colonies were one of their primary markets. Jerry, it just looks like the game plan for the mafia. <laughs> Close enough. All right, the jewel in the crown was India. And if you look at this, this is all.
all of India initially. It goes all the way over here to Burma. Burma was part of what was called India. It was called the Raj. It was the rule by the British Crown on the Indian subcontinent from 1858 to 1947. Prior to 1858, it was ruled by the East India Company. Initially, it was commercial. It evolved administratively, beginning with a manufacturing facility in 1612 in India. So they started in India about the same time they started in America. At the same time, the French East India Company was formed, and they came to India in the middle of the 17th century, and they established similar and competitive facilities. So this was their competition, so to speak. What they did then was they destroyed, the, they being the East India Company with that sizable army, eventually defeated the French. And, and it, the French tried to expand and, and the English rode over the top of them. They scored these military victories. And if you read about these victories, they are very small groups of English trained soldiers against very large groups of native Indians who could not compete with them. In 1769, the French East India Company was abolished. They had been vanquished. The company then did something that was really smart. Now, so far, they've been involved in trade. They started forcing these moguls to appoint them revenue collectors of main portions of the country. That's how they became the de facto rulers of India. In 1857, there was an Indian revolt, and it was the, the Sepoys, who were Indian British troops, revolted against the British. And in specific, what they were arguing or what they were angry about was something called uh, the, the cartridges that the British were giving them were, were covered in fat, I guess, to, to uh, protect them. And the Sepoys had a, had a uh, strong religious, uh, what's the word for it? A religious bias that says that fat is, is an awful thing. They fought for about a year. The rebels surrendered in June of 1858. The next thing that happened was governance of the homeland. Now, this is no longer the East India Company because it was abolished, was instituted in 1858. Control was given to a British governor general who eventually became someone called a viceroy, and that person reported directly to parliament. One of the things that they did in India that was diabolical is they pitted the Hindus and the Muslims against one another. In fact, at one point in time, they even divided one of the states, and Bengal, I think, is up in here, into Hindu and Muslim sections. And they revoked it only after there was a strong, they were going to relocate people from one section into the other. During World War I, Britain declared war on Germany on India's behalf. They didn't even ask. And sometimes when you're wondering where the Brits got their troops from, one and a half million Indian soldiers served in the British Indian Army. By the end of the First World War, things were starting to come unravel slowly. In 1919, 15,000 protesters gathered at a place called Armour Star in, in the Punjab. A British general ordered the troops, and these were unarmed civilians fire on a crowd killing hundreds and of men women and children and they just left the bodies lying in the streets put their guns on their shoulder and marched away the general was brought back to england he was tried before parliament and found not guilty by the end of world war ii india had a volunteer army now of two and a half million men serving with the British Empire forces. 
87,000 Indian soldiers died in combat. They were told during the Second World War, if you support Great Britain, you will get independence. They had been making moves towards self-governance in the 30s, and they were impatient for self-rule. They were led by Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. And in 1947, and, and there was the, the whole story of the partition of India is just really complex. At one point in time, they were going to be a single country, but they could not get the Muslims and the Hindus to agree to any kind of a plan. So the Viceroy said, we're going to partition the country into two, two states. India and Pakistan. The end of British rule, 1947, signaled the day that the empire was at an end. There were still various and sundries, but by then it was all over but the, but the shouting. Now this is a person I wanted to tell you about who was something like Churchill. His name was William Ewart Gladstone. He changed, challenged the British Empire more than any other. He was not an imperialist. He served for 60 years. You were asking about Churchill. This man served almost as long as Churchill did. He was 12 years as prime minister. He was prime minister four different times. He also served as chancellor of the exchequer four times. So in the 19th century, Gladstone was the uh, epitome of Great Britain and its rule. But he had a reputation for being opposed to imperialism. And if you read about him, he did different things at different times. He opposed the British occupation of Egypt, even though it gave the Brits security for their route to India. He also proposed home rule for Ireland, a topic at that time that was not endorsed and it was defeated in the House of Commons. However, oh, this is also with his support, a native Indian was elected to Parliament in 1892. That was the start of building a self independent, focused. Uh, set of characteristics for the Indians. They started, they started uh, home rule on a small level under Gladstone. He, he championed legislation to transform the bureaucracy and put it into Indian hands. One of Churchill's biographers compared him with Gladstone and said he was the greatest 19th century prime minister. He favored the dissolution of slavery and he also favored the dissolution of the empire. He did not actually, the empire continued to grow after him, but he started that ball rolling with the business about Ireland, with bringing the people into, into uh, a colonial bureaucracy in, in different places as a as opposed to everything being administered. And that's what supposedly was France's shortfall. They did not build indigenous bureaucracies. They kept it all the power in their own hands. Now, it's gonna start giving you examples. Palestine, For Great Britain, the colonization in Palestine was a disaster. During World War I, they had made agreements in the Middle East to protect the canal. That's why they did it. The canal is down in here. And what Great Britain wanted in the Middle East was protection for the canal. But they, they agreed with the Arabs that they would grant Arab independence. They agreed with France that the French and the Brits would divide up the Middle East. And then they committed to a national home for the Jewish people in something called the Ballflower Declaration. And to, to put it mildly, there's no way they could do all three of those in any way that made sense. Transjordan 
this area here, that's part of Palestine, was always going to be an Arab state, and they guided it from its beginning as an autonomous kingdom. They had very few problems. They left Jordan in 1948 with very few problems in Jordan. Now, going back to the Versailles Mandate, the British tried to meet the needs of both the Jews and the Arabs alike. They created political systems to facilitate independent rule, and they did not work. Violence became almost immediately after the First World War between the Palestinians and the Jews. And the, and the, 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 the real forcing function was growing Jewish migration from Europe. That's what, I mean, this is not a huge area, and that's what set the Palestinians into, into we're not going to tolerate this. Palestine <clears throat> was controlled by Great Britain for three decades, and there was nothing but a growing succession of protests, riots, revolts, and sabotage by both the Jewish and the Palestinian Arab communities alike. Nobody was getting along with anybody because they hated each other, I guess. Jewish refugees, now this is in the 20s and 30s, <coughs> were pouring into the area. So Great Britain, who had agreed to, to respect immigration and land acquisition, withdrew <coughs> their commitments for that. In the late 30s, and I did not know this, Britain offered to partition Palestine with a small Jewish state and a larger Arab state, and the Arabs refused. In 36 through 39, <coughs> there was an Arab revolt in Palestine. That was an uprising of the Palestinian Arabs against the British, demanding independence. It failed. And by doing what they did, they weakened themselves in advance of the Civil War 10 years later. During World War II, Jewish paramilitary organizations such as the Haganah, the Irgun, and the Stern Gang targeted British administrators. So these paramilitary organizations were going after the Brits. However, 27,000 Jewish Palestinians served in the British Army during World War II. The Holocaust gave the Jews international <coughs> sympathy, <coughs> especially FDR. But after the war ended, Jewish attacks on the British. Now the British are still in control. The British had a sizable army in Palestine. 1947, the UN adopted a resolution to partition Palestine and Britain announced this withdrawal. The next day, the state of Israel declared its independence, and the Brits left with their tails between their legs. They just left. Wanted to tell you a story. I'm going to pull a jerry on you and, and go down an interesting rat hole. You ever heard of the SS Exodus? The Exodus was a ship that carried 4,000 Jewish immigrants from France from France, and I think it left Marseille to British Palestine in July of 1947. This is before the British left. It was the largest ever number of illegal immigrants into Palestine who was operating under, by then, a very rigid limit of how many people the British would allow into Palestine. When the ship reached Palestine, it was boarded by the British military personnel and they, this, this is the ship here, and they refused its entrance. Most on board were Holocaust survivors, but they had no legal immigration certificates for Palestine. It was taken to Haifa, and their sh ships were already returning Jews to their points of debarkation. That's what the British were doing with people in 46 and 47, past their quotas. It was taken back to its point of debarkation, which was France, 
where it was also refused re-entry. So here's 4,500 people on this ship probably designed for 800. The refugees were then forcibly returned to their original points of travel, which were displaced person camps in Germany. Most of them eventually got to Israel after it declared its independence. But it was just, and, and the, the word was Exodus. That's what the ship was called. I want to talk a little bit <clears throat> about the Royal Navy. It was founded in 1546. And through the 18th century, it vied first with the Dutch and then with the French for maritime supremacy. After the 18th century got, after they defeated Napoleon, the Royal Navy was supreme throughout the world for about a hundred years. In the American Revolution, it obliterated the Continental Navy of frigates. And this is HMS Victory. Bill, you remember seeing this. It had 106 guns, a ship of the line. <clears throat> the Continental frigates that we were talking about were 45 or 47 gun frigates. But the entry of France and Spain and the Netherlands into the war balanced the size, all of them together, balanced the, supply, the size of uh, the British Navy. Its most well-known exploits were the defeat of the Spanish Armada and the defeat of the French fleet at Trafalgar in 1805. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, it was the largest maritime force in the world. It maintained an uninterrupted ascendancy over everybody. Their money, their tactics, their training, their organization, their dockyard facilities, they were the finest Navy in the world for about 200 years. Even, <clears throat> even all the way up until World War II, it was still the world's largest Navy. It had a key part in establishing the British Empire. It was the unmatched world power during the 19th and first part of the 20th century. Now let's talk about Malaya. British Malaya is a set of states on the Malay Peninsula here, going down to and including the island of Singapore. They were brought under British control between the 18th and 20th centuries. The Brits first became involved in Malayan politics in 1771, setting up trading posts in a, in a city called Penang, and it's up in here somewhere. Their initial involvement was protection of the local sultan. They were good at convincing these local potentates you let us in and we'll keep you out of trouble. They, they, the Brits, founded Singapore in 1819 by Sir Stamford Raffles, again as a trading post. It was part of British Malaya. Throughout this process, in, in, in Southeastern Asia, they were in competition with the Dutch, who had colonized the area here of Indonesia. In 1824, they signed an agreement, and that divided the Malay world into two entities, which is, which is really still the current Indonesian-Malaysian boundary. Their, their forcing function initially was tin, and then later it was latex production. They federated the Malay states Kuala Lumpur is its capital around 1900. These Malay states were British protectorates. Now, this was not the, in, the uh, commercial. They were under the rule of the British crown following its previous control of the disparate states. During the Second World War, Japan overran and ruled most of Malaya. So the, this area was controlled by the Japanese, just as this area was controlled by the Japanese. And the Brits wanted to resume their authority in 1945. And Churchill said, more or less, if you let me have this to the French, I'll let you have that. That's how it happened. 
Malaya was the most profitable territory in the empire. In the 40s and 50s, it produced one third of the world's supply of tin and rubber. In 1948, the Malayan Communist Party tried to expel Brit Britain from the country. Britain placed Malaya into something they called emergency conditions. And what they were saying was, we will not declare a war because what a war does is cause all sorts of different exigencies with respect to commercial uh, property, commercial insurance. So they didn't declare war against the Malayan revolution. They called it an emergency situation. Churchill, remember what, a, what a imperialist he was, he sent an army general as a high commissioner. He led the efforts to maintain order. Some of the techniques that he used were successfully and unsuccessfully reapplied in Vietnam. I don't remember what, what, what you might have learned, Fred, but when I was a cadet, we had people teaching us what the Brits did in Malaya in terms of reapplication for Vietnam. They formed the strategic hamlets. They moved people out of their homes and they moved them into towns. And they formed the towns and they made the towns self-defensive. There were several differences between Malaya and, and Vietnam. And I'll talk a little bit about them. But the major one was the communists in Malaya never were supported by either Russia or China. During the 50s, the Brits had an army of 250,000 men in this little country. And this, by the way, is also part of Malaya. They defeated the communists. However, Malaya started to proceed in decolonizing. They started to form their own interior government. So Malaya was becoming a self-determining uh, entity on its own with British support. The Brits were not trying. By then, Britain had realized that they were going to leave. What they wanted them to do was stay in the Commonwealth. The Federation of Malaya became fully independent in Mar August of 57. And they ended the emergency in 1960. They said the communists are fully defeated by 1960. On September 16, 1963, the Federation formed the larger Federation of Malaya and the British rule was formally over. Oh, well, I thought you might be interested in this, those of you who uh, ever got to see a rubber tree or a rubber plantation. Rubber has unique physical and chemical properties. Today, most rubber is synthetic. It's made from petroleum. Up until the 20th century, rubber and latex demand was not that large, but it grew very, very fast in the 20th century. As demand grew, Europe wished Rush to produce it in their colonies. It will only grow in tropical climates. This resulted in enormous plantations in Sri Lanka, which is in India, Malaysia, and in Africa. They brought, the British brought these rubber trees to Malaysia from South America. So rubber is not indigenous to Southeast Asia. It's indigenous to South America. That's where the only wild rubber trees are that I could find in the things that I read. But the climate in the highlands of South Vietnam offered ideal conditions for rubber trees. So they were followed by the French in Indochina with rubber. The work in a rubber plantation was very, very dangerous. Plantation death rates in Vietnam were between 12 and 25% per year in Vietnam. I mean, your likelihood of surviving four years is none. The biggest single problem was malaria. They were, they were these plantations were in areas that, that Apparently, malaria just uh, grew uncontrollably. 
the communist activists saw great potential in the rubber business. They formed unions, they instigated strikes, and the Viet Minh used them as examples of colonial exploitation. They used the rubber plantations, I didn't know this, as the center of their propaganda campaign when they were recruiting among their workforce. Next country, this is really very interesting, Rhodesia. I hope you all have heard of Rhodesia. It was never actually in British control. It was always under the control of a corporation. It was initially exploited for gold, copper, but in 1867, diamonds were discovered and the rush was on. Cecil Rhodes was the heart of this exploitation. He founded the De Beers Diamond Company in 1888. By the time he died, he, Cecil Rhodes, controlled 90% of the production of the world's diamonds. The British South Africa Company, now this is like the East India Company, was chartered in 1889. It was the amalgamation of Rhodes, and it was called the Central Search Association, and I couldn't find anything about it in another company, so it was chartered to exploit the mineral wealth in the Rhodesian area. It got a charter modeled on the East India Company's charter. They had the power to not only trade, but also to govern. They raised their own army. They flew their own flag. They decided who got land in Rhodesia. In 1893, with the help of the Maxim gun, this BSAP, the British South African Company, defeated the native tribes from whom they had gotten the land to begin with. And they killed the king who signed away his land to them. Great Britain and Rhodes believed that the conquest of the Transvaal, which is north of, of uh, Cape Town, but south of Rhodesia, they wanted to make it a British colony. And what they wanted, it was at that time, the owners of it, the occupants of it were the Boers, and what they would do if they could conquer it, then they'd bring in immigrants and they would overwhelm the Boers. That was the thinking. This was not the government doing the thinking, this was Rhodes doing the thinking. They began to interfere in, in these Boer republics. They were making demands of them. The Boers were in their way. In 95, 96, Something called the Jameson Raid happened. They raided the Transvaal, they being the colonial administrator and the company police of the South Africa Company. That raid started the Boer War, by, and which they won, by the way, and they overwhelmed the, the Transvaal and it became part of what was then South, Af South Africa. In 1911, the country now I'm back in Rhodesia was divided into northern and southern Rhodesia, <coughs> which are currently Zambia and Zimbabwe. Southern Rhodesia became a self-governing British colony, northern Rhodesia a protectorate, and I'm not sure I know the difference. They both had white minority rule. And in 1965, they established the separate country of Rhodesia, or white country. After a civil war between the whites and the blacks and Soviet bloc liberation movements, Britain could resume control for a brief period and then granted independence to the country, now known as Zimbabwe. Thought you might be interested a little bit in Cecil Rhodes. He was a British mining magnate. He served as prime minister of the Cape Colony for six years. He was an ardent believer in imperialism. He founded the territory of Rhodesia. He set up provisions for the Rhodes Scholarship. And I thought it would be interesting. I don't know if you all know how many Rhodes Scholarships there are each year. There are a hundred. A Rhodes Scholarship is worth $250,000 
which is to be spread over three years. So Georgia, yeah, is that 200 worldwide? I'm sorry? 100. Is that 200 worldwide? 100, yes. 100, 100, 100 worldwide. He was the son of a vicar. He went to South Africa when he was 17 to improve his health. He entered the diamond trade in 1871 and over the next two decades became total domination of the world's diamond market. He entered parliament at the age of 27 and a decade later became prime minister. He led the formation of Rhodesia, but he was forced to resign in 1896 after that attack that I was telling you about. Britain was not happy with him for having started that war. Great Britain canned him. He believed the Anglo-Saxon race was the first race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. You'd call him a racist, I suspect. He advocated settler colonialism and ultimately a reformation of the British Empire so that each component would be self-governing and represented in a single parliament in London. He died very young. He wasn't but 49 years old when he died. He was a very, very influential person in Africa. Do you know the cause of death? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it was gunshot. Kenya, it was the colony Britain never wanted and from which it derived little benefit. It originally was a German protectorate before the partition of Africa. In 1886, Germany and Britain carved up Zanzibar and here's another East, the Imperial British East Africa Company was a commercial association, arrived in 1888. The Berlin sphere of influence. This is when the Berlin group, by the way, the United States was a part of this, but did not get any of these countries. It was established in that Berlin conference in 1885. By 1895, the East Africa Company was getting nowhere in Kenya and it was transferred to the Foreign Office. And that's when they realized that Kenya had an agricultural potential, especially the highlands of Kenya. That's where the coffee plantations are in particular. And I forget what their other main products are. But they began to promote white settlement in the highlands of Kenya. And a large number of settlers were coming in around the turn of the century. And about that time, it was transferred into the colonial office. And if you ask me what is the difference between the foreign office and the colonial office, I have no idea. Its capital was Nairobi. They, they uh, established a regular government in 1906. Now, the departure from Kenya. It was part of the British Empire in Africa from 1920 until 1963. Coffee and tea were their major products. These are huge coffee plantations. Politically, it was dominated, even though the population was 90-something percent Black Africa, and it was dominated by white colonial producers. Kenya was a member of the British Empire. 100,000 Kenyan troops. Where did England get the, their troops from to fight the Germans? They got them from the empire. They got them from Australia. They got them from, from Africa. They got them from India. They got them from everywhere. And 100,000 of them were from Kenya. Now, they talked a lot in the book that I was reading about the Mau Mau uprising. I don't know if any of you remember that. I remember the name. <coughs> it was a war in Kenya between the Mau Maus, and initially it was between the Mau Maus and other black Africans. Only later did they start fighting with the Brits. Again, the British did not declare a war on them. They declared a state of emergency. They arrested the Mau Mau leaders and they convicted six of them, including a man named Jomo Kenyatta. He was a highly respected moderate. He spent something past more than 10 years in house confinement. They also alleged that he was a communist. 
Militarily, the British defeated the Mau Mau by coercion through exemplary force. And what that meant was they put 100,000 people in concentration camps. This General George Erskine, he was the general, I think, of the British 7th uh, Armored Division in the Second World War. He was, he was a law and order man. They suspended civil liberties. They incarcerated, as I said, thousands. They kept the insurrection in check. But by 1960, the Kenyans had had enough. They had majority rule. By then, they had their own parliament. The Brits did set up the parliament. The protected ended no ignobly in 1963 when a black majority government led by Kenyatta. They let him out of prison and he immediately assumed control of the political system. How did the empire and the world wars affect Great Britain's economy? I've never seen this before, but I'm not surprised. If you look at as the as the empire flourished, their national debt went down as low as 30% of their gross national product. The world wars and the loss of the colonial empire sent their financial systems into an absolute reset windup. At one point in time, in a couple of years after the Second World War, their national debt was two and a half times their GDP. Just for calibration, even though we have all sorts of problems with our concerns about national debt, right now, our national debt is right here, somewhere around 100% of GDP. So it is nowhere near yet as bad as the English guy. Conclusions. The British Empire died for two reasons. One was self-determination, and the United States fostered that. And the second was the world wars. They, those wars destroyed them. Their collapse left a void in the world power structure. For whatever reasons, we have chosen to fill that void in the world. World War II was the final pivot point. Korea, Vietnam, and Middle East challenges have demonstrated how hard that role is for us in the 20th and 21st century. America does not seek colonies, but we have become very focused on exporting democracy. The cost, the frustration, and the consequences of this role seem more apparent than ever in this country. Can we afford it? Can we afford to continue to be the world's jailer, order keeper, whatever you want to call it? Now, that's the basis of my talk. I have one more country if you want to hear about it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Epilogue. Egypt. The history of Egypt under the British is short. It was occupied by the Brits during the Anglo-Egyptian War of 1882, and it was to protect the Suez Canal. That's why they did it. The country was economically unstable. Foreign banks took control of the treasury, and they then took control of the canal. The canal was built in 1859 through 69 by the French. The first period of British rule was called the Vale Protectorate. It was actually still a province of the Ottoman Empire, but the Brits had an army there and it became the transportation and communications hub of the entire British Empire. They constituted a de facto protectorate over the country and a, a combined Anglo-French army easily defeated the Egyptian army and took control of the country and kept it for 75 years. In 1914, the Ottoman Empire joined First World War on Germany's side. 
So then what happened was after the war was over, Britain was given a formal protectorate over Egypt. It was brought to an end by a declaration of Egyptian independence. A, a man named Faud declared himself king of Egypt, but the British occupation continued because there were a number of reserve clauses in the Declaration of Independence, which said they didn't get the independence they thought they got. The Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of, 18, of 1936 continued to give Britain the right to station troops in Egypt for the defense of the Suez Canal. By the way, England opposed the building of the canal. They did not want to build it, surprisingly. I didn't know that even though it was its link with the Indian Empire. During the Second World War, Egypt came under attack from Italian Libya, although Egypt itself remained neutral until almost the end of the war. During the war, it was the main base of operation for Montgomery's assault on Rommel. This strategic position of Egypt changed when India was granted independence, but the Brits didn't quite decide do something different. After the war, Egypt wanted to modify the treaty, but an anti-British government was inaugurated in 1951. Well, shoot. In 1952, Ab I think his name's Abdul. What was Nasser's first name? Anyway, he led a coup d'etat. The British agreed to withdraw their troops but then they started a war against Egypt over the Suez Canal. They had no international support. And I don't know if you all remember, but they, they being the Brits and the French, brought airborne forces in, in combination with the Israelis, and took control of the canal very briefly. They got no support, and their presence ended in 1956 when the last British forces withdrew, not with dignity, in accordance with the Anglo-Egyptian agreement after the Suez crisis. Now, one last Jerry drag into something I thought was interesting. Thought you might want to know some basic facts about the Suez Canal. After 50 years of squabbling, it was built by the French. It's 120 miles long, okay? It has no locks. It is all at the same elevation. Tide, the tide flows back and forth between the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Suez. It takes a ship 12 hours from entering the canal on one end or the other to departing the canal. It was controlled by Great Britain and France from 1875 until 1956. The cost of a ship to use the canal is $250,000 per passage. The total revenue of the canal in 2008 was $5.3 billion. Ships go through the canal in small convoys. There are only two places where ships can pass two ways. One is here and I think the other one is here. All other parts of the canal are one-way traffic only. Just like going up and down the highway, coming up and down our mountain sometimes. 96 ships a day pass through the canal. I was surprised at that number. I, I, I guess I thought it was much bigger than that. It is currently operated by someone called the Suez Canal Authority, which is a subsidiary of the country of Egypt. That's it. Hey, George, any? Uh, George, uh, I went through the canal in 1943. Did you really? Uh, it was looked like an old dug ditch. Yeah, yeah. George, any what? comparison to the to the Panama Canal? How many ships go through that versus? Uh, you can Zara? only go. You can only go one way. We right. could only go one way, and they would stop, and then they let the ships come the other way. Well, they they have a passing zone here, but but primarily, I'm sure they have to schedule a ship in advance. They let ships go in groups of about 20. They go in and they start at each end. They pass in this area here, 
it takes 12 hours for a ship to get through the canal. I had, I don't know why, but I had no idea it took that long. Well, it was pretty hot. I do not know the answer to your question, Jerry. I thought about that. I don't know what the, what the, uh, the, the Panama Canal is not nearly that long for one thing, but it has locks. Quite a yes. few, I think. Yes, yes. So I don't, I, you know, I'll, I'll, look, look, it I'll look it up and report back. What, one, oh, ship, uh, what, one ship could not pass the other <laughs> ship in the canal. They can now. They can well, here. Maybe nowadays. Well, and during the uh, during the war with the uh, Israels, uh, the the Jews uh, took a bulldozer and just covered over and went over across the canal. <laughs> One of the reasons that the Brits and the French jumped back into the canal was they were afraid that the Egyptians were going to mismanage it. It would silt up and be totally unusable. That was their justification for going back. Jerry, are our carriers able to traverse the canal now? Do you know? George or Jerry? I That's, look. I, I, think, I think they are. Bill. Bill's the Navy man here. I would ask Bill if he knows. I, I really don't. I, you know, I was on a destroyer. I, 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 <laughs> you could I know. put our ship in the in the in the hangar bay of a, of a carrier. I think, I think they can pass through both canal, the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal. But I remember when they were building battleships, battleships could only be built so wide to get through the uh, Panama Canal. And, the and the uh, Suez Canal can take these super tankers, which are, which are the biggest ships in the world. So yeah. an aircraft carrier theoretically can go through who wants to spend a quarter of a million dollars for a pass? Yeah. So we've got fleets in different places, but I don't believe, I, I don't know that. That's a good question, Clint. I don't know that, that they ever actually used the canal for worship. You would sure as hell be a sitting duck went through the canal. Hey, George, I was curious about did the royal family, say king and queen of England, ever uh, support this this empire in any way, or were they pretty much hands off to let um, Parliament and and whomever do their do their work that way? Uh, there was one king went to India once, for the most part, until very late in the pro process, they let these trading companies run the empire. Now, towards towards the 20th century, they changed that. And I forget which king it was, but one of the kings, Queen Victoria, <coughs> had as her title, Queen of India. She never went there. The one king, one of her children or grandchildren, did go there, and I forget which one it was. He was the only monarch who actually went to one of them. I mean, they went to Australia and they went to the Commonwealth countries, but I don't think they went to any of these colonies that one time. George, okay. Victoria, Victoria did go to India, and that's where they, as a reward, they named her the Empress of India. Look, I read said she never went there. Now, I won't oh. argue. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she was named the Empress of India. Yes, she was. She was named that. But I, look, I read something. You know, it's funny. I'm doing the research for this, I have to tell you that this is a story, and you can get conflict with almost anything I said, depending on what. There, there, there are very few of these facts that are. So totally agreed to that nobody's going to argue. Okay, hey George, I looked hey, this sir. up. Uh, this, this, the longest serving congressman in the U.S. was John Dingell, who served for 59 years. Wow. Robert Byrd was the longest serving senator, served for 57 years. And then John Dingle's wife took his place when he died, and, and she's current congresswoman, 
out of New, out of Michigan. All right, and so Gabby Churchill, Churchill served for sixty-four years. Yeah. Now there was a there was a politician named Hilmer Moore, mayor of Richmond, Virginia, served for sixty-three years. Good Lord. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. Jerry. Jerry, why don't you supply some uh, tech support to Vince over there? I'm not sure what he's doing, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know whether he's it's a move, ready to pay out or what. But he's giving I you think a, he's asleep. <laughs> that's that's my Suez Canal uh, uh, from the Navy. Oh, you're okay. making us dizzy. <clears throat> yeah, is that your that your ship going through the canal there? So that's that's just a picture of a carrier we went through on a Liberty ship. Okay. Good, 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 good story today, George. I enjoyed that. Yeah, that, good, that was good fascinating. Going, very, very, very educational. Thanks, George. Yeah, real good. I have to tell you that I shortcut a whole lot of information. Oh, oh. well, you. You can't talk about the rise and fall of the British Empire in an hour. I mean, I, you did a great job. Of, That's right. You know, I used illustration. Yeah, that was That's good. good. And they and they still drive on the left side of the road in pretty much all those countries too. Uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, One of the things that the British did somewhere <laughs> in the early part of the 20th century. Is they inaugurated English as the national language of India. That's why all of the Indian people that we know speak English so well. They made it mandatory in the in the days of the Raj. That's what kids learned in school was English. Yeah, well, yeah. it's better than Urdu or whatever they speak. <laughs> 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 or do do. <laughs> That's nice. Is anybody Sorry. going to, Jerry, are you going to say something about the Medal of Honor banquet or not? Well, I wasn't planning on it, but yeah, go, uh, you know, Medal of Honor banquet is uh, August, what is it, Bill, 23rd? Let me look at it right here. And we're trying to get a table or two together to go to the luncheon. And uh, if you're, we hope you all would go to the luncheon, and if you don't go to luncheon, you can you have the option of uh, watching it uh, virtual online. And uh, the date is August 25th. Are they going to let they, being the city, let that big a group of people congregate together? Yeah, so far, yes. We're supposed to be the first convention at the trade center. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, since since the COVID uh, shutdown. Jerry, and, I I asked Jules about that. She said that if you have a table of eight, you have an option of splitting it into two four persons, that's correct. Yeah. and that the tables are still going to be spaced fairly wide apart. Right. Yeah. But if you got a group of of six or eight that you're comfortable with, you could you could keep that group at one table. Yes. But if you want more space, they'll go down to a table of four. Right. So a uh, number of us are going, and I hope you know everybody would uh, uh, to support uh, the organization. We need all the support we could get. How do you sign up? How do you sign up, Jerry? Uh, you could do it online at uh, MOH. I'll send a link to everybody by email. Uh, okay. For for the sign up, and uh, but if you if you do sign up, give me your names and I'll tell them to put us together at tables. Yeah. Uh, if you want. Okay, sounds good. Okay. All right. Ne next Thanks a week, lot. Next week, I plan to do the the end of the war in China, the fall of the nationalists, China nationalists, and the rise of the Chinese communists. Wow. What, made them, yeah. what made them what they are today? Now, this, you're going to focus on China? Yes. 
the okay. end of China. Are we still planning to stop at the end of July or? Yeah, I would, that would be our last one. And you you want to keep going, George? Well, I'm starting another one on revolution. Okay, let's talk about that. All right. And it, maybe All right. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning at breakfast we'll talk. To you. Okay. Decide. That's after we talk about Chicago and Portland and all the rest of the countries that are being occupied by the stormtroopers. What's happening there? What's what's going on? You're kidding, right? What? There are there are 150 Homeland Security troops going into Chicago. Yeah, that's uh, I pity them. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Did you see, have any of you guys seen pictures of what happened down at Stone Mountain? I, I, it is frightening what happened down at Stone Mountain. I haven't seen a anything. Of a, hundred, a group of a hundred heavily armed blacks <coughs> staged a protest at Stone Mountain. They had automatic rifles. <laughs> they were armed for bear. Nobody did anything, but well, it was good. about one match from all hell breaking loose. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, I'll send you the link. There's a YouTube picture of it, and it's scary as hell. Where were they? Stone Mountain, down in Atlanta. Oh. I'll send it. I'll send it to you, Jerry. I, okay. I, it sounds good. All right. Thanks, guys. Adios. Yeah. Adios. Adios.